And uh, I want to take a little bit of a left turn this morning because over the last several weeks, we've been talking about the how. How can we process through things like anxiety, depression, uh, trauma? How can we process through those things with the Lord? How can, we, how can we process on our way to healing with Him? Right? That's what we've been answering is, is the how of it. And this morning, I want to really speak into the why. Why God wants to heal us, why He wants to deliver us, why He wants to free us. There is a why behind all of this. And look, it's, it's God's nature to heal. If you have known Jesus, if you have known Him for any amount of time, and if, you, if you've read Scripture at all, you can see this healing, redemptive, re- restorative uh, nature of, of who He is, right? That's His character, is to heal, is to restore. But this is the thing we need to understand this morning, is that God rarely heals and restores just so we can exist. He rarely heals and delivers us and and does these things in our lives just so we can keep it to ourselves. The truth is that God does these things with purposes, specific purposes in mind for me and you. You know, God is very strategic. He wants to use us. And and your life's greatest points of pain, this is such a, a huge point for us this morning, is that your life's greatest points of pain once healed with him, once healed with God, can be your life's greatest points of purpose. Even if you're in the process of being healed by him, even, even if you're in the process of dealing with, with your junk, even in that process, those points of pain can be your life's greatest points of purpose. There's purpose in healing. There's purpose in, in redemption. There's purpose in all of these things. How many of you believe that this morning? And the purpose that he has has for us is that we would be utilized by him to take what he has given us, to take the experience that we have had with him and disperse it to people around us. I I know this woman, uh, and I actually um, knew her more a few few years ago, but she was severely abused when she was younger, went through a lot of junk in her life, uh, sexual abuse, all that kind of stuff, and, and I don't want to get into the details of that, but she went through all this stuff, all this trauma, all this pain in her life. And she met Jesus when she was a young woman. She had this experience uh, with Jesus. And, and as, as she got to know him, he began to do this crazy, powerful work in her life. He began to restore her. He began to redeem her. He began to heal her up in those areas of her life. And what happened was she took what she had received from the Lord. And she said, I'm not going to just take this and then move on. I'm actually going to take this and use it for the good of other people around me. And what she did is she, is she, she had this passion to rescue girls rescue young girls from sex trafficking she would take them she would put them in this halfway house that her ministry her organization owned and and he, she and her team would actually rehabilitate these young girls and she would reintegrate them back into society and my wife actually had a uh, which should i point my wife out she's right over here she's beautiful rebecca <laughs> she hates it when, when i point her out so look at her she's like and Rebecca had actually had an opportunity to work for her for a season of, of her life. But it was just an amazing thing to see this woman who had gone through all this stuff. God had done this amazing work in her. And now she is in the work of re- rehabilitating girls who have experienced similar things. Your pain can be the source of your purpose. And there's this verse in Philippians chapter 2 I want to share with you this morning. Um, we're going to be going back. Uh, we were in Philippians 3 last week. We're going to be going back to Philippians 2. Pastor Keith has really done a good job of working us through the the first half of this chapter. And I want to highlight one verse for us. There is a key verse for us this morning. It is this, Philippians 2.13. It says this, for God is working in you. God is working in you. Maybe throughout the sermon series, you have been uh, challenged by the fact that there's some stuff you got to deal with. How many of you are like, yeah. I, I, I recognize it in my life. I'm dealing with, with some, some emotional things, some mental things, anxiety, maybe depression, maybe the wounds of life, maybe trauma that you went through as a kid. And God, what he does in, in his love, he actually challenges us and he comes to that place and he says, hey, let's deal with this. He does this, this powerful work within us. And maybe in my hope, my prayer is that, that there are things in your life that God has been speaking into for the purpose of healing because that's how much he cares for you. He's working within us, and just as our body needs a doctor at points, right? How many of you have been to a doctor? Hopefully everybody here, if you haven't, you, you should probably go. <laughs> but just as our body needs a doctor at times, it, you know, 
If there's something that, that happens and we need to take medicine, we need to get some type of procedure. It's the same for the soul. It's the same for the, for the mind, the will, the emotions. If, if you're dealing with something in that realm, it's okay to get help. It's okay to get counseling. It's okay to take these things to the Lord. It's okay to talk it out. Why would we neglect those things that is part of our holistic health, right? But God is doing this work within you. Why? Is it so that you would just, just continue living on life afterwards? No. Listen to this. God is working in you. Why? Because he's given you the desire. He's given you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That is such a powerful verse. Nick and I, Pastor Nick and I were actually uh, talking about that last week. What a powerful verse that is. It doesn't, he, he doesn't just work within us. He works within us so that we can know his will. We can have the will, the desire to do what pleases him. And not only that, but he empowers us to do it. That is powerful. That is awesome. And I want to speak into to three primary purposes of his healing and restoration work in our lives this morning. Um, and the first one is this, giftings. Why does God heal us up? Why does, he, why does he do these things in our life? Because he wants us to utilize the purpose of, of our giftings. We have been gifted, and, the, and I'm going to actually jump down in this, in this chapter. I'm going to go to verse 19, Philippians 2, 19. It says this, this is Paul writing to the church in Philippi from a prison cell. He, he wrote all this from a prison cell. It says this, if the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit that he can cheer me up by telling me how you're getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genu genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself. Listen to this. Like a son with his father, he has served with me in preaching the good news. That's, that's a key word for this point is served. Timothy served with Paul in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. Again, he's in prison, so he's probably been wondering that a lot. Like, what the heck is going to happen to me here? Uh, verse 24, and I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. You're probably wondering, what do my, what do my gifts in life, what do my talents have to do with Timothy? And what we have to understand about Timothy is that Timothy was this young believer. He was from this region in Turkey called Lycaonia. Um, and Paul was actually traveling there. He was doing some ministry in that region of Turkey. And he goes to, to encourage the body of believers. He visits the body of believers there. And he, and he meets this young man named Timothy. And he is instantly impressed by him. Timothy is actually called young. And there's, this, there's actually this part of, of um, he's writing to Timothy later on. In, in the New Testament, and he actually tells Timothy, hey, don't, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. And we're not sure exactly how old he was. He's probably in his late teenage years, early 20s. But Timothy had this reputation of being this servant-hearted young man. Timothy had gained respect from the local believers for his servant's heart. And even as a young man, he was utilizing his giftings to build up and support the church and Paul took note of that. Timothy was this guy who had this experience with Jesus, just like all of us have. He, he became a believer in Jesus. He said yes to following him. And he didn't just stop there. He, he said, I'm going to use what God has gifted me with so that I can build up other, other fellow believers that are around me. And he did that. And Paul, in Acts chapter 16, went uh, to this church. He, he met Timothy. And he immediately recognized that this guy was special. And he said, hey, why don't you come with me? I want you to come with me and be on mission with me. Come and join me in my ministry. And if you read throughout more of what Timothy did, it's just amazing. He was a founder of the early church, did amazing things uh, throughout that whole region for the kingdom. I remember when I was in fifth grade, I was about 11 years old, and one day I was sitting in a class, and my teacher came up to me, and she said, Matthew, uh, we would like to test you for the gifted and talented program. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Does anybody know what the Gifted and Talented program is? Some people. Has any, is anybody here, right, there's, a point, there's a reason why I'm asking this, is, has anybody here ever been in the Gifted and Talented program? Okay, a few. Okay, I'm going to be very careful with my words. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If you don't know what it is, the Gifted and Talented program is a special program where they, they select students who show um, signs of above average intelligence and you go and, and you do just a bunch of stuff and have a lot of homework and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
That's a very, that's a very dumb way of putting it. <laughs> but my teacher came up, she said, hey, we want to, Matthew, we want to um, just test you. We want to maybe consider you for this program. And my, my, live, my little 11-year-old brain was like, sweet, like, I'm, I'm gifted. These like, people are like, huh, really? Like, these people are looking at me and they're, they're, they think that I'm gifted and talented. Wow, like, I had friends and in, in gifted and talented. And I was like, man, I wish that I could be with them. I just want to goof off with them there. But I remember thinking, like, like, I, like I felt so special about that, you know? And so I remember I went, I went one day to take the test and I walked into the computer lab and and I don't even know, do they even have computer labs in schools anymore? Is that a thing? No? Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I walked into the computer lab, and computer labs back then were just, I mean, literally just big monstrosities of plastic. They're, they weighed like 75 pounds. That was a computer you know, back in the day. And for those of you who were raised in the 90s, went to school in the 90s and the early, early 2000s, I want you to just close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to just feel the keyboard. You can still feel it, can't you? You can still feel it. Can you hear the clack, clack? Can you hear the clacking of the keys? Like, it was like the loud, you go in for like typing tests with your class, and the, you, you couldn't hear yourself think because the clacking was just so loud, you know? You'd press a key and your finger would like sink in two inches. Like, it was like, they're terrible. Anyways, I remember sitting at the computer. I take this test, and I walk out of that computer lab, and I'm like, man, I aced that thing. Like, I, I killed it. And then I never heard back from them again. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I failed it. You know, and you know that, like, I, I can only imagine that some teacher's like, oh, we, we didn't, we met the other Matthew, not, <laughs> he shouldn't be here, you know? I never heard back from them. No, no call, no I was going to say text. They didn't text back, back in the day. Uh, no email, nothing. They just, they just it, it must have been so bad that they were just like, let's not even remind him that he was even considered, you know? <laughs> but I remember feeling, after I realized I'm not going to get in, I remember feeling like, man, I guess I'm not gifted. I guess I'm not as gifted as I thought I am. I'm not, I guess I'm not talented. I guess, you know, I guess that I'm just going to be giftless for the, for the rest of my life, you know? Again, I was 11 years old. Give me some slack. <laughs> and then I learned that, that all that Gifted and Talented was, was it was a special club for these students to go and do, like, special art projects and, and have more homework. And I'm like, okay, I don't want that then, you know. <laughs> like, I'm okay with that. It's probably a lot more complex than that. Maybe it's my school. I don't know. But, but I, 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 I say that story to say this, and maybe you're here this morning, and, and you have the same mentality you're sitting here, maybe you come every single Sunday, and you're like, I don't know if I'm gifted. I don't know if I'm talented. I don't know. I don't, I don't even know, if, you know what gifts I can, I can give to this body here, just like Timothy was using his gifts. And I wanted to let you know this morning that if, if you are thinking that way, you are believing a lie. You're believing a lie. Because if you're in Jesus, and even, even if you're not in Jesus, guess what? He has wired and designed and giving you this DNA and these giftings to be utilized in life. If you are in Christ, he has given you, purposed you, fashioned you with giftings and talents so that you can use them for the benefit of other people. And if you are a beneficiary of the kingdom, if you have said yes to following Jesus and be a part of his kingdom, then you have a responsibility, a calling to build the people up around you who are sitting right with you in that crowd right now. You are called to help us build this church. It's not just on Pastor Keith or me or Pastor Nick. No, no, it's all of our responsibility to build up what God is doing here. And I want to tell you this morning, we need you. We need you. If you're not serving yet, we need you. And I'm not saying we want you. I'm saying, no, we really need you. I'm just kidding. We want you to. <laughs> there are some of you who are you're sitting here and you have incredible gifts of hospitality. You're one of those people, you just, you have people all over, uh, like all the time, all over to your house. You, you love to cook for people. You love to be hospitable to people. We need you. We have a, a coffee team that you can serve on. We have a volunteer breakfast team you can serve on. We need you. We need that gift of hospitality. Some of you, you are, you are just, you are so good with kids. So good with kids. You love kids. You have a gift to pour into kids. We need you. We are actively looking to build our kids' teams right now. And you can be one of the people that get to invest spiritually into the children that we have coming to this church. We need you. 
Maybe you're like, I, all that I have to give is a handshake and a smile. Sweet, we need you. We got an awesome greeting team that you can get onto and you can actually help people feel welcome, the, the same welcome that you felt the first time you came into this place. Men, we need you. We need you. Every, every single thing that you see here, all the outside stuff, all the flags, all the lobby area, the coffee area, the children's area, the classrooms, even every single thing you see in here, the stage, the lights, um, the chairs, every single one of these things is set up and torn down every single week. The school doesn't allow us to keep anything up, and we have to, to set it up, tear it down every week. Look, that, take, that takes people. That takes people with special gifts. That takes people with, with servants' hearts. And I just want to just challenge us in this today that if you aren't serving, if you're not utilizing the gifts that God has given you, if he has done a work in your life, even if you haven't dealt with things like anxiety and depression, he has done a work in your life if you're in him. He spiritually renewed you for a purpose, and one of those purposes is to use your giftings. Okay, number two. You guys with me? We good? All right. Number two. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I just feel good about myself. I'm gifted. <laughs> number two is this, our giving. So we have our giftings, and we have our givings. Look at what it says, uh, starting from verse 25 in Philippians chapter 2. Meanwhile... So Paul is writing, and he's, he's saying, I want to send Timothy to you. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, and he was your messenger to help me in my need. I'm sending him because he has been longing to see you and who is very distressed that you heard he was ill. And, in, and he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him. And also on me, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him in the Lord's love, and with great joy, and give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. Epaphroditus, this man Epaphroditus, was one of Paul's most trusted companions and what's interesting about about this man is that he was actually many scholars believe that he was actually a pagan before he converted to christianity and had this his life was changed by christ in fact his name uh, uh, epaphroditus means to be of aphrodite aphrodite was a greek goddess the goddess of love and fertility and so his parents who were who were pagan themselves they they had this son they named him epaphroditus and he was living as a pagan before he met Jesus, and his life was transformed by Jesus. After going through the spiritual transformation in Jesus, he was honored by Paul as being this dedicated soldier who always put others before himself and carried a generous heart. And, he, and here's what I love, here's what I love about Epaphroditus is that the Bible doesn't say much about him, but you can clearly see that he was a man of generosity. He was such a generous man with his time with his talents and with his treasure. And at Livingstone, we believe that if, if you are a, 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 a believer, if you are in Jesus, then, then we are to live lives of generosity. How many of you believe that? We are, we are to be people who would exemplify and, and emulate the generosity of Jesus that we have been given ourselves. Epaphroditus was, was so generous, and he, and he led the charge. And prior to, to, to Paul writing this, uh, this book, uh, of Philippians, Epaphroditus actually led this charge uh, to to basically deliver this care package to Paul while, while he was in prison. That's what Paul's actually referring to as his messenger. Epaphroditus, he, he gathered the believers in Philippi, he encouraged them to give, um, and he kind of led the charge in, in taking this care package, and who knows what was in it. I, don't, I think of like, whenever I think of a care package, I think of like cookies, or <laughs> it probably wasn't cookies, I don't know what it was. But not only did he lead the charge in that, but he also said, and I will be the one to deliver it to him. So he takes his care package all the way from Philippi, which was in Turkey, all the way to Rome. He makes this journey to visit Paul in prison, to take him this care package and live generously. He was a man that was always giving, always looking for ways he could be generous, always looking for ways that he, that he could utilize his time for the building of the kingdom. It's an amazing man. When we undergo spiritual transformation, 
And that could be just saying yes to Jesus who gives us new life in him. That could be what we're talking about here with, with anxiety, oppression. When we have this experience with him, this powerful moment with him or moments or this season with him where he does something in our heart. When we go undergo this spiritual transformation, God deposits within us his spirit of generosity. He equips us. He transforms us so that we can share that with other people. There was this uh, guy in our small group, um, and, and I love this, this dude. He, he's so awesome. He's an engineer, so he's very analytical. You know, he's very, he's very thinking. And, uh, and I'm not very thinking. That's my... <laughs> I'm gifted. <laughs> yeah, he thinks about everything. He analyzes everything. And, uh, and he, one day he, he told us, hey, I want to share a story with you. This is on a Wednesday. I want to share a story with you guys. And we're like, okay, like go for it. He, because of his nature, because of how he's wired, he's not super outgoing. He doesn't really talk a whole lot. Um, but he said, I want to share this story with you guys. And we're like, heck yeah, like go for it, man. And he said, um, on Sunday I was sitting in, in the crowd just where you guys are. He said, I was sitting there. And you were talking about the generosity challenge. And this is earlier in the year we had, uh, we, we were uh, announcing what we call the generosity challenge. And what the generosity challenge is, is a challenge to those of us who may not uh, have been giving yet, those of us who had not been tithing yet, or giving financially. We just said, hey, start with 20 bucks a week. It doesn't have to be some, some huge amount. What if you just started living genero generously with your finances, 20 bucks a week, and just see what God does with that. You know, just, just see what he does with it, how he uses it, how he blesses you for that. And so it's funny because he was telling us, he was, like, I could see the engineering in him because he's like, you know, I was just sitting there. I just began to think, well, they probably have some overhead. <laughs> right, and engineer mine. He, he begins to, like, analyze it. They probably have some staff to pay. They probably, you know, so he, he's like, I, the least I could do is give 20 bucks today. So he gave 20 bucks. And, and I don't even know if it was from a faith place. It was more of just say, I, I'm sitting here and absorbing and receiving. I might as well, like, help support what's going on here, you know, which I love that mentality, by the way. But, but listen to this. He gives 20 bucks. The next day, he gets a, a call from his boss, and his boss tells him, hey, we, we would like to give you a promotion. Just totally out of the blue. We want to give you, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a raise. I think he got a raise. It might have been a promotion. I don't know. Either way, it came with money. <laughs> and I remember him telling us this. He's like, it was totally out of the blue. It was, it was not expected at all. It really, there was, there was no um, real reason for it. They just decided to give me this raise. And it's funny because as he was telling us the story, he just began to get this smile on his face. Like, I can't believe that what you guys said is true. <laughs> like, like when you give, when you give generously, God blesses. And look, that's, we're, we don't give to give. I've tried that. It doesn't work. <laughs> I've, I've given before to be like, okay, I'm going to give this amount of money, and then God's going to bless me. And you know, God's up in heaven like, <laughs> come on, man. You know, that's not why we do it. But I'll just say, God uses our generosity, and because he's so generous himself, when we do that, whether we're generous with our time, our talents, our treasure, our money, when we do that, he says, I'm going to bless them. That's who he is as a father. And I just want to encourage and challenge us to be generous. Let's live generously. Again, money is just a very, is just one part of that. But give of your time, give of your talents, give of those giftings that God has given to you. And I just believe that God is going to do so much in your life and through your life when, you, when we're generous. So um, here's the third thing. So we have our giftings, our givings. And number three is our goings. Our goings. There was this thread of commonality that bonded these three men together that we're reading about. Paul, Epaphroditus, and Timothy. There was something that bonded them together. There was this com commonality that they shared, and that was mission. These three men, they weren't just generous. They, weren't just, they didn't just have servant hearts. They weren't just church planters. They, they were committed to the mission of God that he had given them. They were missionaries. And it's so interesting to read about their lives, and they were willing to do anything that it took in order to fulfill God's mission on, on their lives. They were willing to do anything, go anywhere if it meant expanding the kingdom and being obedient to God in this way. If you study the life of Paul, he went through some stuff. 
Listen to this. Paul was imprisoned for his faith. He was imprisoned for his ministry at the time of writing Philippians. He was beaten with rods. Pastor Keith was actually sharing a little bit about this last week. He was put in chains. He was stoned. And not the Colorado version of stone. <laughs> Sorry, that was super cheesy. <laughs> they threw rocks at him and he almost died. Okay, He was stoned. He was whipped. And the list goes on and on and on. He was shipwrecked. These are some things that he experienced in his life. Yet he was still willing to get up every day and expand God's kingdom through mission. If you look at the life of Timothy, Timothy is very interesting because he was... Uh, a mixed Jew and Gentile. His mother was a Jew who converted to Christianity. His father was a Gentile, a Greek Gentile. And Paul one day, when he was with Timothy, Paul, he pulls Timothy aside. He says, hey, look, um, you're half Jewish. You're called to reach Jews. And, and Timothy was. He was he, one of the, the aspects of his life that he was called to reach Jews. He said, if you want to reach Jews, you probably should get circumcised. Which I don't know how Paul knew that. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> they said, Timothy, if you want to reach Jews, because you're half Jewish, underneath the law, all males were to be circumcised. He said, you should probably get circumc circumcised, because if you don't, they're not going to want to listen to what you have to say. And so Timothy says, you know what, I'm willing to do anything that it takes in order to fulfill God's mission on my life, so I guess I'll do it. And then he, you know, cut off part of Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Timothy was circumcised so that he could reach Jews. Look at Epaphroditus. <laughs> Look at if, if you study Epaphroditus, what Paul is speaking to here when he's talking about how ill he was, the reason why Epaphroditus was so ill and so sick, almost to the point of death, is because he just poured himself out for the mission of God. Every single day, he worked tirelessly for the mission of God. He would get up. He would, he would serve Paul. He would go and just look for ways he, that he could expand the kingdom. Uh, again, we don't know that much about Epaphroditus, but we do know is that he was a workhorse, and he almost worked himself into an early grave. And you're probably sitting there listening to this. You're like, okay, I never want to be on mission if that's what it means. <laughs> and and I, I say that, say this, all this, you're probably not going to go through that in your life. None of you. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. You're probably not going to. There's a little chance, but no, I'm just kidding. You're probably not going to go through that in your life, but I, what I want us to, to recognize and learn through the examples of these three men is that they were willing to go anywhere and do anything for the mission of God. They were so compelled by the power of this Jesus that they had come to know and love that they were willing to go and spread his name everywhere they went. And just as I was talking about, that, that God deposits thing, things in us. He heals us. He restores us. He, he, uh, he takes us and he redeems us and he, and he repurposes us for things like giftings and, and givings. He, that also includes going and making it known to the people around us. When I'm talking about mission, when I'm, when I'm talking about going, I'm not necessarily talking about taking your life and moving it all the way over to some third world country on the other side of the world to be a missionary. But if you do want to do that, come and talk to me because we'd love to send you. <laughs> But that's what I'm, I'm not talking about necessarily. What I'm talking about is in your everyday life, the moment that you exit the door, do you see yourself as an ambassador for the Jesus that you call Lord and Savior? When you exit that door every morning, do you, do you see yourself as this missional being that you have been wired and created and empowered to make Jesus known to those around you? God, here's what I love about Jesus, okay? He doesn't just tell us to go. He's already given us the example because he, he has come, right? He came to us. He's a perfect leader because he gives perfect examples of how we are to be. Jesus came to us in flesh, human form, and he rescued us from spiritual death. He pulled us out of the pit. He, then he went beyond that. He pulls us, he continues to pull us out of the pits of life. How many of you can say, I have been pulled out of the pit by God in my life? Right? I have, I have walked with him through the valley of the shadow of death that I've had in my life. Here's what I love about this. Listen to, listen to Psalm 40. Psalm 40, 1 through 3. This is David writing. He says this, I waited patiently for the Lord to come help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. 
He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. Whenever I think about a pit or being pulled out of a pit, I think about falling into a porta potty. <laughs> <laughs> Keith's like, I'm never going to let you preach again. <laughs> And the reason why is because when I was a really little kid, I, I had this like recurring nightmare of falling into a porta potty and I couldn't get out. So whenever, I don't know why. <laughs> so whenever I read this, <laughs> so whenever I read this verse <laughs> about God resting us from pits, I just, I just automatically think of him pulling me out of a porta potty. <laughs> I'm gifted. I'm special. <laughs> he tra- God traverses the valleys of the shadow of death with us. He pulls us out of these places. If you like to camp, which I love to camp, I love to hunt, I love to be in the mountains. If you've ever been in, in a valley when the sun goes down, it gets very dark and very cold very fast, right? And that's what, what David is referring to here when he talks about the valley of the shadow of death. But God comes, he walks us through this place, but, but he doesn't just walk us through. He doesn't just pull us out of the pit. He doesn't pull us out of the pit of depression. He doesn't just pull us out of the, the, the pit of anxiety. He doesn't just walk through the, the valley of trauma with us, and then leave us. He doesn't just say, okay, cool, I got you out of that, and now you can live your life. No, no, he turns around to us, and he says, hey, I have rescued you, I have restored you, I have redeemed you, I have healed you, and now I am calling you to be a partner with me in this missional work. I've pulled you out of those places, now I, I am charging you to pull other people out of theirs. And every single one of us, doesn't matter if you've been in Jesus for a few years, a few months, a few days, guess what? You are called to be on mission with him. How can you be the fragrance of Christ to those around you? Second Corinthians talks about this. We are the fragrance of Jesus. Everywhere we go, people could just, just sense, just smell, just take in this fragrance of Jesus that we are presenting to the world. Do you smell good? How can you be his ambassador? How can you naturally love and live like Jesus day in and day out to the people around you and invite people to come with you? Like being missional doesn't mean going on the streets and doing evangelism, passing out tracts, taking a bullhorn and and telling people they're going to hell. It doesn't mean shoving the Bible down people's throats. What it means is living like Jesus, being Jesus to the people who do not know him and inviting them into this place of salvation, restoration, and freedom. What an amazing thing to be called into. Our giftings, our givings, and our goings. And I want to just close this morning. I want us to take a moment with the Lord and really respond to him in this. Because we've talked a lot about the how, the how of processing with him, but not not too much about the why. This is kind of a message. You have to respond to him. It's just, you know, (laughs) how could you not? Well, let's take a moment. Why don't you just close your, your eyes, bow your heads, and just take a moment with the Lord right where you are. And begin to ask him, Lord, you have done these things in my, in my life. You have saved me, ransomed me from hell. I have eternal life with you. Maybe you've been pulled out of the pit of despair as David was writing about in Psalm 40. Maybe you've overcome depression with him. Maybe you're, you're in the process. But guess what? There's purpose in those things. There's purpose. And I just want you to ask the Lord, Lord, can you show me where you want me to have my purpose? What are the gifts that you have equipped me with so that I can, I can be a, a builder of the body of Christ around me? How do you want me to give of my time, my talent, my treasure. How do you want me to invest because of what you've done in my life? How do you want me to be generous? What does it mean to be on mission with you? How can, how can I be used to reach people around me? Father, we respond to this message today saying yes to you. Would you help us to be a people with purpose? We don't want to be, we don't want to be uh, receivers and takers. We don't want to be people who just, who just sit and receive from you all the time. We want to be people who are then able to give back because of what you've deposited within us. 
Help us to be those kind of people, people of the kingdom. This morning, maybe you're, you're sitting there and, and you're like, well, I don't know him. Maybe you're in, you're in, a, in the deepest, darkest pit, which is the pit of not having a relationship with Jesus. And I want to invite you into this incredibly powerful, dynamic, life-giving relationship with him. The word tells us that every single one of us, every single one of us, we have sinned against him. Me, you, we have all made decisions, committed sins that have not pleased him. They've broken his loving law for us. They've broken his heart. And the penalty, the word tells us that the penalty for sin is death, spiritual death, separation from him for eternity. But here's the good news. Here's the gospel, is that Jesus took on flesh and he was the ultimate sacrifice for us. He said they can't do it themselves. They can't pay for their sins themselves. So I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. He came to earth. He lived a perfect life without sin. He was tempted just like you and I both were in every single way. But he chose not to sin. He lived his perfect life. And at the end of his life, he was crucified. He became the one and only sacrifice for us. He paid the death penalty for us that we could not pay. Three days later, he, res- he, he, he resurrected. He, he, he showed us who he was, that he was God, that he has power over death and sin. And now he calls us into relationship with him. And the word tells us, tells us in Romans, that, that if we want this relationship, if we want eternal life, we don't have to strive for it. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to work for it. All we have to do is believe in our hearts that he is who he says he is and that he has done what he has told us that he did for us. And we confess with our mouths that he is Lord and we will be saved. So right where you are, if you have not, if you have not given your life to Christ, I want to just invite you to pray a prayer. And the prayer is not what saves you. It's, it's really what happens in your heart. But just pray a prayer similar, similar to this. Just say, Lord, I come to you this morning and I recognize that I've sinned against you. I confess my sin. I have made decisions. I have done things that I know that have not pleased you. But this morning I'm asking for your forgiveness. I'm asking for your redemption. I'm asking for your spiritual healing in my life. Thank you for saving me. I confess that you are who you say you are. I believe it in my heart. Thank you for paying the penalty on the cross for my sin. And help me to live all all the days of my life in relationship with you, intimacy with you. I give my life to you this morning. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I want to just, if you could just continue to bow your your heads. We're going to close here in just a second, but in continuance with this reverence, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, if if that's the first time you ever ask Jesus to come into your life, I just want to ask you to do one thing for me. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. We don't do that here. But if you could just raise your hand. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, could you just raise your hand? Just, just raise it high for me. Thank you. If you did receive Christ, if you started a new life with him today, I just want to encourage you to come and talk with me, talk with one of our pastors. We would love to give you a gift, give you some next steps that you can take in your life. Um, You just made the best decision of your life if you did that. Can we just give it up for those who who may have potentially given their life to Christ? Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in our life. Thank you that you are doing a work within us. Thank you for taking us through the valleys of depression and anxiety and trauma and wounding. Thank you, Lord, that that you have taught us how to think right. You've given us the roadmap to restoration. Thank you, Lord, for pulling us out of the pits that we find ourselves in in life. Thank you for doing that work within us, Lord. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we just stand and let's worship one more time this morning?